you. Turn your Bibles, please, to Matthew chapter 5. Matthew 5. We're going to read verses 43 to 48, but I want us to pray first. So stand with me. We're going to pray, and then I'll read this passage. Okay, let's stand together. Dear Holy Father, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, we bow before you in Jesus' name and we ask you tonight to help us as we, as we have a hunger and a desire to be disciples, growing as disciple makers, a growing desire for that, and then a then a then an increasing function in that. To be honest uh, with ourselves, to practice what our Lord and Savior Jesus taught, uh, the original twelve, uh, which has not been upgraded and needs not to be upgraded for 2,000 years now. Help us to learn from our Lord. But as, as we prayed this, time, this morning, you know, that we'll be doers. We'll do. Help us to think through what it means to come to Jesus and remain, to be with him, with him. So lead us in this tonight. And I think about is to thank you this morning for, for getting to meet uh, Norman and Linda's neighbors. Thank you for that answer to prayer. Thank you for that faithfulness in their reaching out to them and loving them and help us to see that more and more and more. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Stay, remain standing, please. We're going to read Matthew 5, 43 to 48. You've heard that it was said, you shall love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I say to you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, so that you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. For he makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good. He sends rain on the just and the unjust. For if you love those who love you, what re reward do you have? Do not even the tax collectors do the same? And if you only greet your brothers, what more are you doing than others? Do not even the Gentiles do the same? You, therefore, must be... And this word was bone chilling. You must be perfect as your heavenly Father is perfect. Thank you. Be seated. This is the inerrant, infallible, all sufficient word of God. Now, I'll tell you what the Greek word here for perfect means perfect. That's what it means. Jesus here, of course, is in the Sermon on the Mount. He has, uh, if you're familiar with chapter 5 through 7 of Matthew, you know that he's, he's basically at this point showing them how the Ten Commandments are internalized. They're not just surface deals. You can't say, well, I never killed anybody. Jesus says, well, have you been angry in your heart towards someone? Yeah. Well, that commandment's been violated by your heart. Well, but I've never committed adultery. Have you ever lusted? Yeah, well. See, so internalizing the commandments, and he moves through the idea of, of divorce and, and oaths and retaliation. And then he comes to sketch out the more excellent way. In fact, I think it's Paul's, Paul's knowledge of Jesus' teaching about this that, that gives us 1 Corinthians 13. Love. You see, Christianity is a labor of love. Now, when you say labor, that's you love those who love you. There's no labor in that. You love those who are like you. No labor in that. In fact, I would remind you, and I, my country, Western. Uh, 
discography is, is a little weak, but I, there is a country western singer who's, who made popular and famous, I think made a lot of money off a song, I love the way you love me. Right? So what does he love? He loves himself. You love me, and I love, not you, I love the way you love me. I, I love that. There's love of that. Jesus, however, taught a different example. The, the Jews taught that you should love your brother. And at best, tolerate your enemy. So Jesus does this, you have heard that it was said. So he's, he's drawing from their rabbinical literature, teachings that he knows they were exposed to. Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. Of course, later on, we know in Luke's gospel, who, who is my neighbor? And he takes this very unlikely scenario. We know the story as the Good Samaritan. But you remember it real quickly, it's, A man falls among thieves and robbers, is beaten nearly to death. Jewish leaders on their way to worship pass him, and they, uh, he looks in a pretty bad way, so they move around from him, and they would love to help him, but they have duty to God. And then this Samaritan comes along. The Jews couldn't even say Samaritan without gritting their teeth hardly. And Jesus uses that to teach about loving your neighbor. I say to you, love your enemies. Pray for those who persecute you. Okay, so that's the, that's the, the master's way. That's, he's teaching this to the, the Sermon on the Mount, but he models it for his disciples, the twelve that he's training. So that, here's the purpose, you may be sons of your Father who is in heaven. This is, what, this is what my Father's children act like. For he, your Father in heaven, makes his sun rise on the evil and on the good, sends rain on the just and on the unjust. It says, God shows kindness to the evil. He shows, gives provision to the unjust. And then he, of course, says what I just said. Well, if you, if you love those who love you, that's, you know, I mean, the tax collectors do that. They have a little group that they love one another because they, they love each other. They have the same goals in mind. If you greet only your brothers, the Gentiles do that. So you must be perfect. He's, he sets a standard that is above even what the Pharisees had taught that you must do. And he's done this to shock us and to convince us it's unattainable. It's, it's, it's very much like what Martin Luther would experience centuries later when he struggled with the righteousness of God, knowing that God demanded perfection. And he, no matter how hard he tried, he couldn't attain it. And if he had ever managed to attain it, he knew that there was a past that he had not attained it. This was John Bunyan's dilemma when he tells about hopeful in Pilgrim's Progress. I, I, I consider this, that if I were to somehow get to that level, to that measure where from this day forward I perfectly manifested and maintained righteousness, I have this past to account for. I've got, I've got this debt that I have no way to pay off of when I wasn't. It's, it's designed, folks, to press us to the end of ourselves so we realize, I cannot do this. And then the Lord says, on your own, you cannot do this. You need me. You need my perfect righteousness. In other words, it, when applied, when pressed to us, it forces us to give up trying somehow through our own righteousness. And coming to rest in him and experiencing by grace through faith what's called an evangelical obedience where it's a, it's a heart that desires to obey. It's a heart thing. And that's what Jesus is teaching here in the Sermon on the Mount. So, he's getting them at this point to, uh, to think 
outside of themselves. And I want to jump forward to an example of this. If you look at me at Matthew 22, 36 to 40. What's the great commandment? We've gone through this in Mark recently. This should not be new to you. I'll just touch on it. Well, he said to him, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment. The second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. He says that you can sum up what we would know as the Old Testament in loving God with all that you are and loving your neighbor, loving others as yourself. As you yourself want to be loved. It's about love. Now years ago when I was first understanding Reformed theology, I reacted against a, a maudlin sentimentality approach to love. It was kind of syrupy. It, was, it didn't have any, any biblical substance to it. It was superimposed upon the Bible. But you know what? You, you don't do well. That's, that's moving from one ditch to another ditch. Because the scripture teaches us that God's manifestation of himself to sinners is primarily love. Yes, there's, God has wrath. Romans, Romans 1 teaches that. The righteousness of God and the wrath of God. And when you see Jesus, Jesus didn't come to condemn the world, John 3 said, because the world's already under condemnation. Jesus came that the world through him might be saved. It's, Jesus came as an as a infallible, tangible demonstration of the love of God for his sinful creation. <laughs> So with, with love being what drives the train, this is what I want us to challenge ourselves tonight. Do I, do I love people? Do I love other people? I say, well, I, I love my wife. Well, pastor, you ought to love your wife. There'd be something wrong if you didn't. Okay, well, I love my children. Good, good. That check, but that, again, grandchildren, yeah, great. Neighbors? Oh, well, I want to. Enemies? Jesus is teaching his followers that love, and I promise you, I have, all I did was meet these folks this morning, but I promise you, if you could dig down deep with them, what they would tell you is that they have been, they have been on the receiving end of Norman and Linda's love. And they're going to tell me, well, I'm impressed with how they know the scripture. Even though they do know the word of God in a pretty impressive way, that's, it's their love. They've shown to them. So I want you to look now just a little, little in, in Matthew beyond the Sermon on the Mount. In Matthew chapter 9. We'll spend a portion of the time here. Chapter 9 verses 35 to 38. Jesus went throughout all the cities and villages. Teaching in their synagogues. And proclaiming the gospel of the kingdom. Remember, what, what does gospel mean? What is it? It's, the, it's simply good news. In fact, gospel comes to us from an old English good spell. And it's just contracted, gospel. It's good news. And healing every disease and every affliction. Now, that, every kind of, I think is what he's talking about there. What was he doing? He was proclaiming good news. The people who needed good news, who didn't have much good news in their lives. In fact, what they heard was, this would be the typical message that would, would come to a Jew, a, a, your, your, your average Jew, uh, God is holy and just and it's too late for you. But you can still try. There are certain types of people that I talk with and I... I don't want to just blurt out, but, but through the years it's been consistent. And when I, as, I, as I talk with them about the Lord and their need for Christ, and I say to them, do you have uh, assurance or confidence that you will go to heaven when you die? And they'll say things like, 
I hope so. I'm not sure. I don't know. It's, it's, in a, it's in a whole cluster of people that are all from the same religious background under the rubric of Christian. Uh, where, how's the good news grip them? Jesus came proclaiming good news and then demonstrating compassion. He wasn't on a healing mission. He was showing them that this one who's telling us about this good news has incredible compassion toward people. And so the next verse shouldn't surprise us. When he looked, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them. Because they were harassed and helpless. Like sheep without a shepherd. Folks, I want to tell you something. If, we, if we'll open our eyes and look around, do you know what we're going to see in people today? They're harassed. They're helpless. I've been on a journey the last three weeks with my youngest daughter, and I won't go into the details of that, but I've been in an arena that I've never been in in my life, <clears throat> and boy, I feel for a lot of people at a certain level, a strata of our society, who are harassed and helpless. And people are not, not always willing to help. Jesus looked on the crowds and had compassion. And so I asked myself, I've been in some interesting lobbies recently, looking around, do I have compassion or disdain? Like sheep without a shepherd. That, he, he would look that way, wouldn't he? Because he is the great shepherd and he would recognize people who are lost sheep, who have no one to protect them, no confidence that they'll be fed. And then he said to his disciples, and this is the part that we, we, we need to, to let just grip us tonight, the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. <clears throat> so I ask you, and I, I've had to ask myself this, is that the way I see the harvest? Do I see it as I look around? Do I, do I have a, an evangelical scorched earth mentality that looks around and says it is just dry as dust and burned over. There's nothing there. Now, you know, James and John had a little bit of that when they wanted to call down fire and brimstone. You can't say that what they were suggesting was compassion. The harvest is plentiful. Do I see that? Is that how I see the harvest? Because it hadn't changed. People were not more in need of salvation then than they are now. They were not even more savable then than they are now, if I can use that term. For years growing up, I was taught explicitly or implicitly that, that I lived in a Christian nation and we needed to have pity for the poor, benighted people in. And then you could go Africa, China, South America, wherever. Just poor, pitiful people. They, didn't, they don't live in a Christian nation. Poor people. And I think that mentality has harmed us to this extent that we now live in, I think it's the fourth or fifth largest mission field in the world. So how do we see it? Well, we can be resentful because things have, have changed. Uh, or we can be thankful that, that the Lord is opening our eyes and not letting us be blinded with a, with a mythological view of things. So, historically, in this, we put, we've put up, taken the notion that people who are willing to put up with the gospel agree with the gospel, and that's not true. But now they don't put up with it. 
we're back to the days in this nation when the apostles were going out. Because I promise you, there, there is a national religion in our country. It, it has some different heads, sec, secular humanism, multiculturalism. Uh, and it advocates the rights of everyone except folks who would suggest that the scripture is the final authority. I would remind you, if you read Gibbon's Rise and Fall of the Roman Empire, that the Christians in the first century were charged with the crime of atheism. Now folks, under, here, understand me now. In terms of the, of the prevailing view in this country right now, we are the new atheists. atheists. We're the cultural atheists. We don't embrace the gods of multiculturalism. We don't embrace the gods of political correctness. We don't embrace the gods of humanism. We don't embrace the gods who, who treat life so lightly at the, at the front end, at birth, and then at death. We don't do that. And so we are the cultural atheists. Some of you were not around or paying attention in the 60s when the civil rights movement was underway and the peaceful protest and, and the terrible things that were happening in that. But for those of you who were, who watched your television sets in black and white, did you ever think, watching that, that the day would come some... 50 years or so later, 50, 60 years later, when an entity called a Civil Rights Commission that's formed in, in many states, if Oklahoma doesn't have one, it's just a matter of time, when the Civil Rights Commission would be the vanguard to say to evangelical preachers and churches, you can't talk about that about marriage. You cannot say marriage is for man, one, one man, one woman, in, in a one flesh relationship for life. I hope you're reading these things. I hope you're up to speed on them. That's what's happening. We're the cultural atheists. So, so we've, got to, we've got to look and say, how do, I, how do I respond to that? Does it just make me angry? Or can I look upon people like that who hate my Jesus and who hate my gospel and who, <coughs> who are willing to hate me because I am identified with both? Do I see them as harvestable? Do I see them as worthy of being harvested? Or do I see them as, a, as an, uh, an obstacle to the advance of Christianity? How do we see them? Because Jesus says, look. Because the fields he's talking about are filled with Jewish people and Samaritans and non-Jews. None of whom had a predisposition to like the message he was bringing and teaching his disciples to bring. They were the cultural atheists of the day. The Jews called them atheists because they did not believe they, they honored the one true God. They called them blasphemers. They called Jesus a blasphemer for saying that God was his, his father. The Romans called them atheists because they did not embrace all the Roman gods. We can learn from this if, if, we're, if we're teachable. But the labors are few. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest. Do, do I believe that the labors percentage-wise have increased? Well, we know from statistics that, that every year as population grows and as churches close, that the percentage of Christians in this country diminishes. So just mathematically, the laborers are fewer. But the next question is, 
Where am I? How do I see myself? Do I see myself as a laborer? Because if we're followers of Jesus Christ, then he's talking to us as laborers. Therefore, pray earnestly to the Lord of the harvest. And here's where I think we have to check. Does my theology of God's absolute sovereignty push this? The Lord of the harvest. And I don't know if you remember when, we, when we've looked through this in the past, this, this phrase, to send out laborers. That is, that's so pretty. To send out laborers. It's a compound word in the original language that literally means to throw out laborers. It's like throwing out the first pitch. Pray, because the harvest is plentiful and the laborers, the laborers going voluntarily are relatively few. Pray the Lord of the harvest that he will take laborers and throw them into the field. Now we don't need to feel just beat ourselves up about this because I would remind you that, the, that Christianity would have stayed in Jerusalem had it not been for what? Persecution. Read the book of Acts 8 and 9. Those scattered by the persecution went everywhere proclaiming the gospel. Pray earnestly. And so as I, as I break this down, as someone who wants to be a disciple, growing as a disciple of Jesus, being more like him, have, wanting his, his heartbeat to be my heartbeat. I don't want him beating differently. I want, I want his heartbeat to be the monitor that, that affects the rhythm of my heart. Do I see the world the way he sees it? Where do I see myself in the whole laboring discussion? Do I pray for laborers? Do I pray earnestly? This, this earnestness, this engaging, this agonizing, In this passage, Jesus describes the great need and the great solution. The great need is harvesting. The great solution is workers. Do I have that Isaiah mentality? And who shall I send and who will go for us? Here am I, send me. Now, if you read through Matthew, it's interesting. After he tells them to pray this, remember what he does? He sends them out two by two. Now, you can almost see, I have, I have in my mind this picture of a prayer meeting. Because I think the disciples, would, they would just take Jesus seriously when he taught them something. And so I think they had a prayer meeting and said, Now, Lord, oh God, our master's right. The need is great. And we're but a few. Oh God, raise up, thrust out laborers to go into the middle of the harvest. Do that, God, for your glory. In advance of your good news, for the good of those in the harvest who, are, who, who need to be touched. And I can almost see the prayer meeting wrapping up and Jesus looking at them and saying, you two, you two go such and such place. You two, you two go. In other words, be the answer to your prayer. I think sometimes the reason we're afraid to pray those kind of things 
In fact, I've talked to people who said, I, I don't pray the Lord send out missionaries. I'm afraid he's going to send me out. The bottom line. Do I love the unlovely? Do I love those that do not like me? Do I love those that despise me? Do I love those that are unkind to me? Do I love those that don't love me? Because the safest place in the world is to be with people that you know love you. It's easy to respond to folks who love you. Easy to respond lovingly. The safest place in the world to be is with people who are like you, who think like you, who agree with you. But that safest place in the world is not where the harvest is. The harvest is not in here. The harvest is not in our meetings. Well, thank God when, you know, we've, we have our children, our grandchildren who need, need to be saved and God's using their pl being placed under the word, the parents and grandparents praying for them. Yes, all those things is good. We never overlook that, never, never uh, not appreciate that. But that's not where the harvest is. The harvest is among those that make us uncomfortable. The disciple maker said, that's where I want you. I want to encourage you to go back and read, we're not going to do it tonight, to read uh, Mark's gospel, I think it's chapter 4, the parable of the sower, uh, the seed, and the soils. We went through that together, studying that through Mark. Go back and read that again. Just read it with these lenses on. Look into the field. The harvest is plentiful. The laborers are few. Go ahead and read that and see the different kinds of encounters that you'll have when you do go and you sow and you reap. Read that again sometime. So love is what drives the train. Now we should love one another. If, if we don't love one another, we'll, we'll, we'll never make an impact on our culture. Why in the world would God bring those who've been unloved into a place that's not loving? That's just not going to happen. I've said years ago, God doesn't intend to build a spiritual nursery on a toxic waste dump. He doesn't do it. He never has. He never will. So we should love one another. Goes without saying, but we need to say it anyway. We don't, have the, we don't have the liberty or the privilege not to love one another. But when we've done that, and we say, look, Lord, we love one another. He says, good. Doing that, the world has a better opportunity to believe that, I, that, I sent, that God sent me. Has an opportunity to believe that I've saved you if you do that. But here's, it doesn't stop there. Love the unlovely. Love the belligerent. Love the mean, the despiteful. Love those trying to take your freedoms away. Love those who are not like you and want you to bow to their agenda. Love them. Jesus did. The disciples did. And they turned their world upside down. I've concluded I'll be more effective at that if I plug in with one or two who can hold me accountable in that, where I can be transparent and honest and say, you know, I had a situation this week where I needed to love somebody, and I didn't, and I repent. I need you to pray for me. So when I talk with those one or two folks again, they say, how'd you do this week? Did you have an opportunity to make that right? How's your heart coming on that? If love is the key, 
And we need to be sure that we're using all means of grace God's appointed to us to fan the flames of love in our lives. To repent when we, when we are not going that way and not manifesting that. And then bearing fruit of repentance in that. I, I really believe, Lord, folks, that that's the way the Lord is going to build His church. And I close with this. Have you noticed that churches that are not perfectly straight in their doctrine can have a reputation of loving? Have you noticed that? It's not that doctrine doesn't matter, it does. But what, what if you could wed? What if you wed accurate doctrine with powerful love? That was the weapon of the first century church. And they almost brought down the Roman Empire with it. And you watch, as God gives us years, you watch. Places right now that we see as strongholds, places that are in the top 10, top 25 of the most persecuted places on the, on the planet where Christians live, the most persecuted circumstances. Watch. Some of those places are going to fall. Because the Christians that they're slaughtering en masse show them a love. John Piper said it years ago at a conference where he spoke at one of our conferences. And I'll never forget the imagery as long as I have a memory. He said, have you ever thought what it's going to take to win the Muslim worlds? He said, have you ever read about battle in the Old Testament? Wars in the Old Testament. He said, do you know what happened then? If the captain came to you and said, I want you on the front line, the front wave today. He said, you went and told your wife and family goodbye. You weren't coming back from that battle. Because you would, be, you would face the spears and the swords and the horses of the oncoming army. And you'd have the rest of your army barreling down behind you. You were not coming back. And he said, here's what it's going to take to see the world of the Muslims collapse under the weight of Christianity. He said it's going to take bodies stacked up incredibly high until they say, look how they love their Savior. They're willing to die for Him. So what's it going to take? I don't think right now we live in a situation where it's going to take bodies stacked up with martyrs. But the day's coming here. I'm convinced of that. So let us, brothers and sisters, let us work while it's day. Let's purpose that what we're going to do is love one another and love those who constitute the harvest and purpose that we will be the laborers who will go into the harvest with the word of love and see men and women and boys and girls brought savingly to Christ to join us as laborers in the harvest. Let's pray. Dear Holy Father, God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, again we bow before you. How many times uh, must you say it in the scripture? Certainly, certainly one should be enough for those of us who claim to be your disciples. Love your enemies. Forgive us, Lord, when we have fallen into the Jewish snare of hating our enemies. Forgive us when we have substituted your command with simply tolerating our enemies or ignoring our enemies or avoiding our enemies when your command is specific and explicit. Love your enemies. Father, raise up in this place an army, even if it's a small army, of people who will go forth saying his banner over us is love and that is our word to those who hate us. Raise up 
a group of harvesters here. And then bless our efforts to the salvation of those who are so different from us, with whom we don't find really anything in common, and yet see you bless and live to experience having the gospel of Jesus Christ in common. Make us disciples determined, desiring, and committed to be disciple makers. For Jesus' sake, amen.